for the last four and a half years, we've been around 350 to 400 K per month in revenue. 95% of people that sign up also stay on our monthly subscription that we have as well. It's always been above that 300 plus 350, 400 mark. That must so, feel amazing. I also envision this since the beginning. Ask any one of the people that work internally close to me. They'll say I'm the hardest worker. I work more hours than anyone. Go on reels at night, scroll through, see the ones that say a million likes, 10,000 shares, and remake that video in your own way. And if you do that for 365 days, you will have multiple videos that get over a million views. Welcome back to the Beyond the Wealth podcast. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez, and today we're in store for another amazing episode. I am joined by Dre Medici. Dre Medici is somebody who is well known in the online space and has been extremely successful building a ton of really cool businesses. Brother, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, brother. So obviously people in the online world know you. You've got, I think, over 600,000, 700,000 followers on Instagram. That's part of your core business. But you had so much success kind of starting side hustles and businesses early on, whether it was sneakers, events. Talk a little bit about young Dre before we kind of go through to where you are now. For sure. So I'd always wanted to be a successful entrepreneur since a young age. I knew that if I wanted to have certain things and live that lifestyle that I aspired and you saw in Miami, it was going to come from my own efforts. So from a young age, as you mentioned, you know, nine years old, I was already with my dad camping outside of Foot Locker, Champs, doing all that, getting the shoes, reselling them on Facebook groups the next day. And just all throughout my you know, childhood, I was also a soccer player. So on the way to games, I'd be you know, finding people in different parts of Florida and meeting them up to sell. Um, and then I kept doing that you know, throughout everything. As I grew up, I started to get into, as you mentioned, tickets. So throughout high school, I was doing my own events, reselling tickets to Ultra, Rolling Loud, and just any way I could to make money. You know, I was you know, just trying to do it in the best way possible. So I then took those talents into my first Instagram business at 17, which was a fitness business. And you know, when I launched that, I knew that was my first business that was going to be long term and really change the trajectory of my career as an entrepreneur. So that was kind of the start of everything. And at this early age, I also come from a background of selling sneakers. I think that's a hustle a lot of kids started with and learned kind of what it was like to turn a dollar into two dollars. Where did that come from? Did you have entrepreneurs around you? Did you have any mentors or was it just something natural that you had you wanted to kind of pursue? Yeah, I think at the time it was just seeing maybe older people right at that time maybe if i was like a young kid in elementary maybe seeing some of like the fifth graders or you know maybe there was also a middle school there at the same campus i was at um so things like that kind of just led me to seeing other people in the space or older people on facebook and then i just knew that if they were doing it i could do it also in that time you're clearly learning you've gone from all of these different smaller businesses then the fitness one is kind of that first one that takes off for you. It was around, if I'm correct, health, meals, like how to be fit and have a good looking body, which I think anybody in Miami, if you want to compete and you're a single guy or uh, you want to be a good looking girl, you've got to be fit. Where did that business stem from? Yeah, so throughout my whole life, I had also been a soccer player while I was an entrepreneur. And being a soccer player, you need to be in great shape. You need to cook your own meals, go to the gym on top of going to practice. So naturally, I just ended up, by the time I was in, you know, my junior year, I had an incredible physique. So I already had a six pack, you know, I was just looking at my best. And so a lot of people started asking me, hey, how did you do this? I see, you know, on Snapchat, you're posting that you're cooking for yourself every morning and after school and stuff. Tell me a little bit more about how you did it. So it instantly clicked. It was like, okay, I had been doing all these, you know, side hustles my whole entire life. Now, this was one that I knew it wasn't just a seasonal business. It was something that would always be around. I could keep doing it forever. And so that's when it clicked. You know, this is that perfect business for me to go into. I can change people's lives, which is what, which is what I was always passionate about as well. And it just fit perfectly. So, you know, me having the skill set already by doing it throughout my, you know, soccer journey, I just had to teach people exactly what I was doing, started studying, you know, of course, getting into nutrition as much as possible, and then just taking that, applying it helping other people. And the second that I saw, you know, I was able to transform just one, two people. I knew that was it. And I was going to scale it up to end up helping, you know, close to a thousand people. And what was the primary growth from that business coming from? Was it testimonials, the results? Was it ads? Because I know now in this bigger business, you have a 
your hands in a lot of different ways to grow on socials, but for that business, what was the driver? That's a great question because that's one of the things that made me stand out and something I'll always remember. Um, it got to a point where I would even just go out to high school parties and like people would be like, womp, womp, womp. Like everybody knew about it in a close area because what I did was all the high schoolers, people that were around me, I just said, post these testimonials on your story. So part of it was testimonials that I needed to build up. That's the key for any business. If you have testimonials and they're real, and you can connect people with those actual customers, you can win no matter what. But essentially in this case, what happened was I knew that if these kids, you know, who just wanted to make some extra money on the side as well, could make money with me just by posting an Instagram story, then I would get multiple people doing that. So there was a point where I probably had over 250 high schoolers that were actively every day posting the testimonials I would receive on their story and any lead they got, they would send me their number and I would take a phone call with them, take my own sales calls, and then they would get $20 commission. So I literally would have all these kids just posting stories every day, promoting it. Every high schooler, I would even just start making promotions. Just if you want to make money, DM me, you know, it wasn't even just stories about getting into fitness. So it was making money. So I had all these high schoolers, eventually college kids also posting it. And so it just grew naturally like that. Everyone was seeing it everywhere. Um, and then it just spiraled into me being able to service so many people. Seems like you were a little bit early on like building a big affiliate network and leveraging that on socials. I, something I like to ask when I have an athlete or a past athlete that's a business owner, do you think that being a child athlete and having to go through that grind at a young age helped you now as an operator, as a business owner? 100%. You know, it builds that discipline and that character. There was countless nights when, you know, I would literally go to school, then I would have to go to soccer practice. And then I would even, at one point, I was playing for both my school team and club team. So I'd have two practices. I would need to fit in the gym. And then I would have homework and I was so exhausted. I'd have to wake up at 5 a.m. to do the homework, study for the tests, you know, last minute. So all those, you know, grind periods really shaped me for when I wanted to become an entrepreneur and had to go through the sacrifice and that journey. It was something I was already accustomed to and not something I needed to get used to. Yeah, and, and I think that answer is very similar when I ask people. I just love to ask it because I know for a fact there is athletes, younger individuals listening to this thinking, why am I doing this? Like, why am I grinding so hard in high school and not out at the party? But I also played sports through college, and I think it's really important for these young people to stick it out because so many of the things you learn at that young age are so easy to implement into your life and put you light years ahead of the person that just went home after school and kind of messed around and didn't have any structure in their life. 100%, yeah, definitely. So you're doing this fitness business, it's going great. Now there's this little gap here where you drop out of college, you send it to New York at 18, and you essentially rent, lease, buy out an office. You're 18 in New York and you have an office, Take me to that part of your life, good and bad. Yeah, definitely. So essentially, this was a time in my life when I had already started seeing success. So I had launched this business during high school, and now I'm coming into college. I'm still getting all these notifications of money coming in on a 24-7 basis. I'd even launched an e-commerce store to go with the workout meal plan business at that time, too. So that was taking off as well. And I was just in these classes feeling, you know, very down, right? I was in this college environment, living in a dorm room, right? Making all this money. And it just didn't make sense. Cause again, I was seeing other people around me. I was now at this age on Instagram, seeing some other entrepreneurs that were around my age and did drop out and were doing it successfully. So I knew it was something that I could do. And I remember like if it was yesterday when I literally just called my mom, called my dad, my dad really didn't really care. My mom was more of the strict one with school. Um, cause I, my dad didn't go to college. So that was also part of it you know, as well, I'd always kind of felt like I would have done the same thing. Um, and so basically I remember calling my mom, telling her, she was like, Oh, I don't know if there's the right decision, etc." But I knew it was the perfect decision for me. So when I went into this little, basically you have to like go into the administrator's office and tell them that you're going to be dropping out. They were like, you realize I was at UF at the time, which was okay. a pretty good school. Yeah. So they were like, yeah, you realize if you, you resign, whatever, you know, you drop out, you can't just get accepted again. It doesn't work that way. And I was like, no problem. I don't care. Cause I knew I was never coming back a hundred percent. Like it was not something that I was like, Oh, maybe I'm going to regret this decision. So I went out to New York, as you said, had that office, um, hired my first couple of employees that I had in that office. Cause it was a three person office at the time. 
And, and yeah, I just started cranking away, testing, finding what was working. I was still working a little bit on the workout meal plan business. And then it hit me because now at that time I had been working on Luna. I had my personal brand. I had all these different other businesses that were succeeding with the same formula. So all of a sudden, one day it was just like, that's the business I need to go into, digital marketing, everything I just did for myself. I need to use that as case studies and do it for everyone else. So it was a grind. It probably, you know, my first... I'd say seven months in New York, I wasn't really making that crazy money yet, no six figure months or anything like that. But all of a sudden, you know, come, I'd say after those seven months, once I really started cranking away with the agency, it was a game changer because I went from selling a service that at the time, I didn't have the business knowledge as well to craft offers in the right way. So the product I was selling was a one-time service. It wasn't even a subscription offer. It was just you paid 120 one time, you got the program, that was it. So that was already one mistake. Every month you have to hustle for new customers. But then now my minimum offer was 1500 with the agency. So the same amount of time I spent on 12 phone calls, now I could make that same amount of money on one phone call, right? So instantly, my income drastically changed. I started bringing on other team members to help me expand and sell as part of the company as well. And so, as I said, once I did that, reached six figures very quickly. And since then, you know, it's been, you know, skyrocketing since. At that young age, 18, 19 years old, did you find any struggles in the fact that some people might not take you as serious, no matter what the business is doing because you're younger or because you're coming from a kind of, I don't know, junior standpoint from an older business person, even though you're a successful entrepreneur on his second venture that's doing six figures. Yeah, I mean, probably some people felt that way, but I will tell you, I remember perfectly, you know, when I started the agency, one of the first clients that I actually got was somebody that was like a 60 year old man, maybe even older, like 70 year old man, and he had a few restaurants. It was called Spice Thai in New York City. He had a few restaurants and I literally just walked in cold and didn't even, you know, message them or anything. I just walked in. I said, can I speak to the manager, the owner? The owner happened to be there. I sat down, you know, spoke to him with confidence, tonality, professionalism, told him about my offer, showed him the results. I was already getting Luna and he was like, I'm in, you know, and I signed him and all the businesses. And so it wasn't so much that I had experienced that failure of my age and things of that sort. Maybe there's people online that have judged that. But I think if you can come with value and have real results and conviction in what you're offering and again, having those past case studies where you know that you can show that and leverage that and they're truthful, then I think that age is not really a factor nowadays, especially because some of these older people know that the people with these answers are the younger people. So that is something that maybe there's, there's ways that I struggled with that throughout the time, but not something that really stands out or that I can remember. So the business that we keep talking to is Grow With Us Agency. That's your digital marketing agency. Where is that business at now? You've been running it for five years, I believe. Where is that business at now? What does the monthly look like if you're allowed to talk about those numbers? Yeah, that's fine. So being honest, you know, I've taken on many ventures throughout the time that I've been with the agency. You know, Luna is also focused. I've gotten into real estate. Also, what we're going to talk about is LinkMe, an app that I joined early on, became the co-founder of. So because of all these factors, I haven't went like fully, you know, balls to the wall. Let's scale this to 10 million, you know, a month, you know, crazy numbers, which I know I can do if I built out an affiliate marketing system and went and did free events in every state and really, you know, scaled in that manner, which I know is something that might be a possibility and might be something that I pursue in the future. So it's been something that's kind of just... Once I reached a number that I was confident and proud of, we've kind of just cruised around that number. So I'd say for the last four and a half years, we've been around 350 to 400K per month in revenue. And we also have basically 95% of people that sign up also stay on our monthly subscription that we have as well. So we have about 200K a month in monthly subscriptions also. So yeah, the agency has been, you know, steady hitting those numbers, but it's never been something where, oh, one month we hit below six figures or below 200. You know, it's never been something that's dropped. It's always been above that 300 plus 350, 400 mark. You mentioned you've got 95% retention, which anybody listening is probably like, that's amazing. You've had this business now five years. 
I want to make sure anybody listening that might want to work with that business understands really what you offer. Can you kind of explain what comes with that offer and that subscription in case there's someone listening that wants to go ahead and join that? Definitely. So basically what it is that we offer is there's so many industries out there and no matter what industry you're in, there's always going to be competition in that industry. Okay. And so your goal with such a busy market with so much traffic, you need to see how can you stand out from the competition? And so if you can find ways to work with a marketing agency that can give you that leverage to stand out from the competition, your chances of seeing success and being considered the top in your industry will happen much faster and much more efficiently. So if you're any type of business, a restaurant, a dentist, a realtor, whatever it is, and you're hovering around 500, 1,000 followers, what we can do for you is organically, we can grow your following to amount that, that you desire, really. You know, it can be 15K, 20K, even 100K, or like we did for Link Me and my agency, over a million followers, and we've done that for a few other companies as well. And then the next part is helping you with your content, strategizing so you can go viral with your content too, and make everything look aesthetically pleasing, because the first thing someone does, they look at that following, then they look at the content, then they look at the engagement so we make sure you have great engagement too and then lastly once you have these key components and you have a nice page that is going to convert at the highest level you want to get into lead generation so we have many different services we do for lead generation we have an affordable targeted outreach service we have a mass dm service we do ads as well and so once you have this incredible first impression all of those marketing efforts will perform much better an easy example is if you spend a hundred thousand dollars a year, let's say, on a page that has a thousand followers or one that has a hundred K, you can spend the same amount of money, do the same targeting. The page with a hundred K is going to get more followers, more clicks, a better watch time, everything, because it simply holds people's attention more because that's how psychology has worked for hundreds and hundreds of years. For hundreds and hundreds of years, people, you know, say to dress to impress, wear a suit to that interview, right? So it's the same thing on social media. If when somebody sees your page for the first time, it stands out you're gonna have a better result. So just to summarize and make sure I'm understanding, it is like a full full service marketing service. Anything that you would need from a business standpoint, you guys are a partner in that and would be able to run it. And the way you're describing it sounds uber professional and something that I would wanna use for my business. So I wanted to make sure we highlighted that in case there are people that do wanna join that. So we've talked about, you've kind of alluded to Luna, which we'll talk through and go through that whole part of your business. But I want to talk about the app that you mentioned, LinkMe. So you're a co-founder of LinkMe. I might butcher this, but I believe it is 1 million active users and it's over 100 million valuation. You guys have raised some capital for this business. Talk to the viewers about what that company is and how that kind of came about. Yeah, so essentially when I had this workout meal plan business, so it stems all the way back to that, I started gaining a lot of traction locally, right? People were really knowing me locally and people were impressed by it because it was a simple business. To be honest, I was selling a Google Doc. I had zero cost on the business, um, but it was so good that I got so many people saying, wow, 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 just even if it was a Google Doc, I made it look incredible. But going from that, I then launched the agency. So the same people that were entrepreneurs that were keeping an eye on that saw, wow, he launched an agency. And now this is taking off incredibly. So this guy clearly knows what he's doing with marketing. He has a restaurant also. All these things started coming together. And so about, I'd say four and a half years ago, it was um, two buddies, Val and Nett, who are the other co-founders. They had worked with me on some events and selling tickets and stuff in the past. And they had just been watching that growth, right? And I was really one of the main ones from, you know, kind of childhood that had taken off so early, already had the car, all that stuff. Um, and so they said, hey, we have this idea for an app. At the time, their idea was simply to have the exchanging of information. So you have the business card and then you can exchange that information. And they brought me into a meeting in Pompano where Nets dad's company is located. And Nets dad's company has also now gone on the NASDAQ as well. So he has a lot of great relationships. And so me at the time, you know, I'm a young kid have this agency, have this restaurant. I didn't necessarily have the resources and the relationships to be around someone who's about to take his company on the NASDAQ. So I knew it was an opportunity that I had to take because something was there that I was gonna be experiencing new things, meeting new people, being in investment rooms that I hadn't ever gotten a single penny in investments for any of my companies. So I knew it was gonna help my growth as an entrepreneur. 
And so they basically showed me this idea, showed me the projected valuations that could, that could have. And they started, one of the things that they were showing me was the app is going to be worth more based on how many, how, many minute, how many minutes people spend on it per day. So I said, okay, if it's just a tool where people are going to exchange information, people are not going to spend that much time on it per day. They're just going to use it every now and then. And, you know, hopefully they'll use it a lot, but we don't really have any ways to keep them on the app. So this is when I brought my value and everybody in the room was like, oh my God, this is huge. And I said, we need to turn this into a social media app because I had been such a big, you know, obviously social media expert all these years. And I said, you know, Gary V at the time was also always talking about how you need to be on every platform. If there's another platform that comes out, be on it. If TikTok comes out, use it. So in my head, there was still room for another platform because if the owners, us in that case can spend millions and millions of dollars bringing people to this app and a consumer can come on for 100% free and post about their business and we're driving traffic and they can get free followers, free leads and maybe they wouldn't get on another platform because the timing, the algorithm is not there, people will find value in that. So that's when I said, let's make it a social media app. So we did that and now what happened? You know, you're able to compare your valuations to Twitter, to Instagram, to some of these bigger companies because for example, Linktree on its own has a billion dollar valuation, which is kind of similar to it. But what separates us, they have a billion dollar valuation with one of our features, right? We're also a social media app, so then we can leverage that we're going that direction. People can run ads on the feed. There's so many different opportunities that open up. So that's basically what happened with LinkMe. They wanted to bring me on. Obviously, I had a lot of value at this time and leverage that I could, you know, propose. And so I, I didn't just get, you know, uh, treat them as a regular client that I was just going to charge them for services. I actually got equity in the business, um, became the co-founder, became the CMO. And then after about a year, we were starting to pitch and his dad was starting to host these big pitch events and speaking on stages. And I just started to think, how would it help the company? And maybe it would help me too, but I really cared more so about the company. If they could say that, oh, one of the co-founders who at the time was 19 years old when I invested, invested into this company, right? So I invested 100K um, at this time. I was like 20 years old around that. And I invested 100K as well, just to show my devotion to the company. And then to be able to now over all these years, the first thing they say on the call is he invested at 20 years old. So a guy there, seven years old, thinking about investing is going to use that and say, wow, these guys are, you know, legit. So that's kind of a little bit more about the story with LinkMe. In, in that whole conversation, you kind of highlighted this as a big growth part of your entrepreneurial journey. I mean, you're still so young. There's still so many businesses ahead of you. What have you learned and what, like, what are the biggest takeaways from kind of jumping into this new arena? Because there's a big difference between the agency life, which you can make a ton of money, but now you're sitting in the kind of corporate and big money world where you're raising capital. What did you take away so far from that part of the journey? I would say the rooms that we were in um, throughout this journey is very important. You know, we've been with RBC, right? We've been with very, very big names. Um, Amaranth Bank now, another company that we've sat in that's very interested. So it's just reassuring myself that I can speak, communicate, and provide value in some of the biggest rooms that I could have ever imagined. Um, so. It was exactly what I thought it would be. You know, it would be a company that gets me in these rooms because it has the resources I didn't have. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of lessons from being in those rooms. I was even there when, when the IPO happened for the NASDAQ because I had helped that company, his dad's company with marketing as well. Um, so that was an incredible experience I came from it too. And, and now it's just, there's gonna be a lot of other new experiences. Like there hasn't even been what's yet to come. You know, there's gonna be, potential IPO or a big exit, you know, all things that I haven't experienced with any of my ventures yet. Um, so those are going to be some exciting things to come for sure. Before we jump over to the Luna part, in these two businesses, especially the agency, you've got massive teams and I, I follow you obviously and nobody hires as much as you do. You're constantly hiring, constantly giving people opportunities. One, what traits do you think are needed to be a good leader? And what have you learned from leading and hiring all these people so early in your career? Yeah, so when it comes to being a good leader, there's a lot of different books that you can read on being a good leader. But one thing that's gonna make you a great leader 
you need to kind of be born with it in some way. I was being called a leader before I had ever read what a leader was or how to be a good leader. People just saw that in me, whether it was on the soccer field or when I would do volunteering camps throughout the time. Um, you know, anyone that was there, a counselor, anyone, they would just saw me as a leader. People gravitated towards me. Um, was nice, humble, genuine with everyone. So definitely you have to be born with it a little bit. If you're not born with it and you need to craft that, of course, um, which is okay, right? There's many ways to do that. I think it just comes from remembering the position that you're in. A lot of bad leaders, the reason why they're bad leaders is because they forget how to treat their team. And this is the biggest thing because if you start treating your team in an incorrect way, your company, your team is going to fall apart. And now what are you without your team? And so that's one of the biggest takeaways that anyone should take from this. It's always remembering how to treat your team. There's going to be moments when you're frustrated, when they make a mistake. But if you always kill them with kindness, be extra kind, all these different things that are so important, they're going to remember that forever. They're always going to have your back. They're always going to show up. They're always going to have a good attitude. And so it's extremely important that you remember how to treat your team, even when it's not easy to treat them that way. Right. And so I've been able to keep team members that I knew for the company's benefit, although they weren't the kindest person, they needed to be in the company. And I've sucked it up. You know, I've dealt with them. I've dealt with all the you know, times where they didn't talk to me how I like, but it's part of being a leader. Sometimes you need to do what's best for the company. You can't, you know, let emotions get into it. Um, so that's what I would say for, for being a leader. Those are some different things that you need to mainly focus on when it comes to having that evergreen growth. And, and what was the other part that you mentioned, the second question? Yeah, it was just like, what have you really learned in hiring all of these people? And you kind of alluded to that in what you had just mentioned, but what takeaways have you gotten from this journey of hiring hundreds of people? Yeah, so when you start to hire a lot of people, it's obviously going to be overwhelming. One, because you're creating more expenses in your company. So if you're bringing on people, not always are you going to bring on somebody that by bringing them on, you're making more money, right? Sometimes you need to sacrifice, you know, not seeing money right away because you're thinking about the long term vision. So something that I'll talk about with that is when I hired my first assistant. So I had never hired an assistant before probably until this was about four years ago when I did this decision and I had a partner at the time too and he didn't want to pay that assistant. So when we originally said we're going to hire an assistant, I said, all right, we'll split that cost obviously. And he didn't want to do it. And I didn't care that he didn't want to do it. So basically he said he was going to pay and he would pay him. And it went three, four months saying, oh, I'll, I'll pay my part. Don't worry. But he didn't do it. And then he ended up saying, oh, we don't need it. I don't think we need it. Let's get rid of it. Till this day, that assistant became my COO. We plan on opening companies together. We've traveled the world together all over Europe. We've done so many amazing things. And there was a time period when maybe he was costing us money. Maybe we were putting money that I could have been doing the extra work, but I had the bigger vision. And I said, I know if I want to be a big company, you have to make those investments that you don't always see the money right away, but it's going to give you that professionalism. It's going to make you a real organization. It's going to make your other team members feel that you're investing into the company, which is so important. And so that's one of the takeaways that I'd say is, you know, sometimes you'll bring somebody on and they'll make you money right away. Other times you need to bring people on that won't make you money right away because you're thinking about what they'll help you in the long term. Some people would charge five grand for an hour of mentorship to go through some of those details. And I appreciate you sharing that with people because the majority of our audience is entrepreneurs, people that have businesses, whether it's at the startup stage or they've been crushing it for five plus years. Getting some nuggets of information from an operator like yourself, those are things that I want to give to our viewers as like nuggets that they can go and take, implement into their business and be successful. So I appreciate you being so open and sharing that. We keep talking about Luna. We've mentioned the restaurant. Unshameful plug. I freaking love this place. You started a restaurant with your dad. One of your main goals in life was to have your dad become a millionaire. You've talked multiple times about coming from humble beginnings, not having all of this family money. Talk about what it's been like to start a business with your dad and just talk about the origin story of Luna. So the origin story basically would happen since I was young, my dad was always a chef, but obviously being employed as a chef, you know, didn't really have his own restaurant as a CEO or anything like that. And I remember there was a time, this was about, I'd say close to eight years ago when the owner of the restaurant that he was part of working at 
had died. He went to India, tried saving someone's life and he died. And so my dad was left in a position where, you know, the wife of the husband of her husband that, that died, um, they just decided to sell the company and give it to other owners. And so my dad kind of had to go figure it out for himself. And I remember my dad was so depressed for two years. He didn't have money. He didn't have a job. He was like trying to figure it out. He was making, you know, proposal decks to give to people to launch his own concept, Medici. He wanted to do this restaurant, but he didn't have the money for it. It was just a dream. He was showing it to people. No one took him seriously. People were just saying, no, I'm not interested. And so all of a sudden he saw that it was two years of just trying to figure this out, get something off the ground. And he was in crazy debt. So zero dollars in his bank account, you know, has to pay bills. Um, I have a younger brother who so suffers with some mental, mental illnesses, a little bit of autism and stuff. So he had to pay for therapy and stuff. So just couldn't afford anything, was just struggling so, so bad. And I had also struggled growing up with my dad. Like when we were moved here from Uruguay, you know, we struggled financially. So it was always something that fired me up. You know, my dad never has money. You know, I need to do something to make him successful. And so when I was just seeing, you know, he would call me, I'm depressed. I have nothing. I was grinding at this time, working on my side hustles, then working on the, well, the WAMP, then working on the agency. And all of a sudden he got an opportunity. And basically the opportunity was that one of the chefs that he had known from his past times working in kitchens had this little location, okay, which is the first Luna location. This location was doing $10,000 per month. It was barely doing anything, it was horrible. And so one day my dad popped in, from God, you know, he, he saw the space and he was just like, what is this pasta shop? And he, he knew the lady. And so he started talking to her. He would come in and just start helping for free, little things like that. Next thing you know, they offered him 50% of the business for him just to come run it, bring all his knowledge, everything. That's when you started seeing people come into Luna, Luna build its name. And we took it from with that small little location from 10,000 a month after you know several years of my marketing to three hundred thousand dollars per month so completely transformed that business and then now five years later we were able to go ahead and start another restaurant which is the same concept but next door so we were able to open up another location and to dive in a little bit more on those details about three and a half years ago once i started making real money we were able to go ahead and make an investment of $250,000, which I sent that wire and we were able to go and have 100% ownership of that restaurant now. So took out those original partners that originally gave us 50%. We took them out and now Luna is completely owned by us. And so that was a great accomplishment. And then once we did that, we went ahead and opened that second location that I just mentioned as well. So that's, that's the journey with Luna. How was it? taking a stab because like your dad had the background you have n no background in the restaurant business what was it like sending that two hundred fifty thousand dollar wire and essentially betting on your dad to go in and crush it that must so, feel amazing yeah so it was a little bit about betting on my dad but also knowing what i'm capable of doing so i had already succeeded with that small location bringing in customers so i told him you know he was freaking out more than me even though he didn't have to put up the capital i told him don't worry, it's 100% going to succeed because I know how to bring customers. And so I had that conviction. I knew, okay, I can make other investments, crypto, digital marketing into ads for my agency and probably see a bigger ROI, but this investment was a different one. You know, it wasn't one to see the biggest ROI. It was one to put my father in position, which is my passion and what I've, you know, been on this journey for. And in the future, it'll be to help other people that aren't just family members as well. Um, but yeah, you know, I knew that it would work because he's proved himself obviously with his side of things, with delivering with the great food and great service, which I credit all to him. But I knew what I was doing when it came to bringing new customers on a 24 seven basis. And so I knew with that formula, a marketing formula and a good product, it would work. And now, as you said, when you go, you always see a packed house, you see people that you know. So it's definitely thriving and, and soon we'll obviously be able to break, um, you know, into that next level profitability after we go through all these uh, expenses to open a new location. Dude, it's amazing. And again, like I said, my fiance and I go there twice a month. We've been going there for the last few months. I actually got a chance to go to the original location. That was where I first kind of fell in love. The food's amazing. The vibes are great. 
And now that I have, imagine, I was already going. Now that I have the backstory behind the whole thing, it's even cooler. So we've just gone through your whole journey here from a 9 to 17-year-old hustler in all of these different niches, takes the agency, goes in, builds a massive business. I think you've had over 20,000 monthly subscribers. You've got that business doing three, 400,000 a month. And then you go ahead and get to join as a co-founder of this app, raising capital, potential big exit, and you own a restaurant. And how old are you? 24? I turned 24 two weeks ago. Okay, so you were 23 for the majority of all this. Dude, what does it feel like to have accomplished so much by such a young age? It feels amazing, but I also envisioned this since the beginning. I knew that I was going to accomplish all these things because... The second that I launched that agency and I saw those numbers, I'm telling you, I called everyone I knew. I said, this company is going to the millions because I saw the vision. I knew it was a guaranteed service. I knew it had the high ticket. I knew it had the monthly. I knew it had everything. And so it's just been that consistent grind, putting your head down, not just living that flashy lifestyle, but actually doing the work. You know, ask any one of the people that work internally close to me. They'll say I'm the hardest worker. I work more hours than anyone. You interviewed some of my friends. Yeah. You know that. So I, I put in the work. I put in the hours. And I don't just put in the work and put in the hours with anything, which is the most important thing I want to teach people. It's you can put the same amount of work, same amount of time into being a construction worker. But if you do it with something that is high ticket, that has a big LTV, that is recurring, that has upsells because people want to keep buying from you, where you can build a team because they're also making multiple six figures being with you, then you can accomplish all of these things. But you need to make sure that you have all of those ducks in a row in order. And now, thankfully, you know, when I was, I think, 22 or 23, I can't remember. Yeah, 22, I made an investment, $180,000 into a multifamily property. So that's now being, it's been redeveloped for the last like two years now. And it should be being rented in, I think, three months. And I also purchased a $1.5 million property in downtown the Elser. I had to put down 40%. So wow. a very, very big investment on that. Um, and now I'm going to be buying some more real estate as well and getting into that arena too. I've been already connecting with some very, very big names in the real estate space. Um, I've been helping a lot of my real estate clients close a lot of deals with our lead generation services at you know, crazy ROIs. Um, so going to be getting more into that arena again because it's high ticket, right? So I want to be around any and everything that's high ticket. So I just continue to mention that to as many people as I can. Get in arenas that are high ticket. You know, you were just telling me about what you do on the side as well, which is very, very high ticket, you know, 200K to a million dollar deals. And that's why I instantly told you, I agree that that's a great opportunity, you know, because anything high ticket is worth your time. Yep. hundred percent. What would you say? Because there's definitely at least one person who's still with us right now watching, taking notes. If you could drop a one to two minute brain dump on a CEO or entrepreneur listening, what is the best advice you could give them? The best advice I could give is probably everything that I mentioned in this podcast so far, but to wrap it up and repeat some things, I'll give you some of the top things that come to my mind. Um, the first one, which we just emphasize on a lot, make sure you're in a high ticket industry. The second one, make sure you have conviction in what you're selling and you truly believe in it. Because every time I speak to someone, they say, I believe you and your offer because I can hear how passionate you are in what you do. The second one, as I said, is be a good leader, treat everybody nice all the time, over deliver. You know, I'm one of the cheapest guys with myself personally, but I'm not cheap with my team. You know, I'm always giving bonuses. I give a guy 15%, I'll send him a 25% commission. You know, I'll always up the bar and just try to over deliver as much as I can for other people. The next tip of advice is build a team, right? Whether you're, even if you're part of a company and not the owner or the CEO of that company, build a team within that company. Because if you're selling a service and now you build a team of people that are also selling that service and you can just break off half of your commission, now you can build huge streams of revenue for you while you're not even physically the one closing. So that's the next tip that I would give. And lastly is build your personal brand, whether you work with a marketing agency to get that boost and build your following, or you just do it you know, from ground up just by posting viral content. 
The biggest tip I would give is right now the way that people are going viral is they're mimicking other people's content. So go on the For You page at night, go on Reels at night, scroll through, see the ones that say a million likes, 10,000 shares, and remake that video in your own way. And if you do that for 365 days, you will have multiple videos that get over a million views. You will get leads, you will then get customers, you will then get testimonials, you will then be able to use that money to spend money on paid traffic, and you can have a million dollar business as well. That's the simple sauce right there. That is the simple blueprint too. And for people listening, like when you, when you talk about going through and remaking that video, so many people think like, oh, well, you're just ripping them off. No, it's normal in they the industry. They rip in somebody else off. Exactly, it is normal in the industry. Obviously, don't go word for word on the script, but go take that winning idea and put your spin on it using kind of the core hook that's what everybody does. So like, don't feel bad about doing it. So many, I talked to so many people. They're like, oh, but I don't want to take it from them. They took it from somebody else. Go take it. Dude, that was spot on. And I couldn't agree more on that as a just simple blueprint for anybody that wants to go and open their phone up tonight and start a business tomorrow. Start making content. Start looking at what people's content in that niche are successful. And in 365 days with consistency, you can almost guarantee that they're going to win. 100%. And, and that's another thing too, just for anyone that still has that thought lingering in their head about copying or ripping someone off, think about not just copying any video, but the trends out there. We see trends happen all the time. Maybe you remember one where it was like, if you're a credit hacker, you know, you know about going to the MX lounge, or then it's like, you know, two people talking or like any of these trends that other people are all copying each other at the same time. Instagram picks that up. You use the same audio, you use the same tonality, you use the same type of phrases. They pick that up and what they know from their machine learning algorithm is that if other people watch that kind of video, many people are gonna watch this kind of video, therefore they stop, they push that out to people that they usually wouldn't because they know that that's the type of video that has already gone viral, it's pleased their audience, it's kept people on the app and that's their goal. So it doesn't need to be that you copy exactly what somebody in your industry, exactly what they said and then they're seeing that and they're like, why did you copy me? But copy the trends out there that you see are happening. If you think about you know, the TikTok era when all these influencers are blowing up, they were all copying each other's dances yep. you know, and then they would go viral copying the dance. So you can go ahead and just copy the trends, use it in your own way, and it's definitely the best and easiest way to grow than trying to reinvent the wheel. I always like to motivate the viewers to set goals and to really shoot for the moon. So I ask this question to every entrepreneur at the end of every interview, and that is, what has to happen in the next 10 years for you to think that you succeeded? Number one, seeing my dad as a millionaire tra traveling the world, leaving, not having to be at Luna, you know, just go travel and have fun. Um, that's, that's the first one. The second one, which I'll do in less than 10 years for sure. Um, the second one is just transforming more lives and definitely doing world tours where I'm going to the poorest places in the world. I'm hiring these people. I'm giving them jobs. I'm giving them phones. I'm keeping them on the team long term because um, I can literally take anyone. They don't need to have skills. They just need to say thank you for the opportunity. And the things that I give people to do are some of the easiest tasks in the world. A 10 year old could do it. Um, so definitely doing that, expanding to just help as many people around the world as possible because I know I have something that, like I said, I can just put them in that vehicle so easily. So I'm definitely going to start doing that very, very soon, hopefully in the coming next coming year and continuing to do that long term. Um, the other part is me being genuinely happy. I was actually on the phone uh, on a Zoom call with a billionaire who recently joined the Link Me team as like a director, one of these positions. And he was literally talking about he mentioned how he's really big into like he has a therapist and all this stuff and one of the guys on the team was like oh like what do you do with that therapist and he's like well to be honest i've had the last three years have been hell for me it's been the hardest years of my life and you'd think oh the guy's a billionaire he's on forbes as a billionaire why is it you know the hardest three years of his life and it just goes to show you money is great if you have a reason to utilize it, right? So for me, part of the reason, I'm always giving money to my dad every month, money, 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 because I know it's gonna help him and not have to so stress so much about money. Um, you know, giving it to my team members, giving it to all these other people that I can help, donating. So money is great if it has its purpose, but if you're just chasing money without a purpose and you're not balancing the other key components in your life, which are, you know, love with your friends, your family, maybe a partner, 
health, keeping that in check um, to its maximum potential, your mental health, then money isn't really doing anything. Money is great because it allows you to focus on those other things, right? It clears up that mental real estate of, oh, I need to pay these checks, I need to pay these bills, and it lets you focus on those other things. So for that, it's awesome. Right, but don't let that eat your head up. Don't burn relationships because of it. You know, if a sales guy said, Oh, you promised me 25%, now you're giving me 15%, what's going on? Give him the 25%. You're not gonna worry about that money in the future. So little things like that, you know, don't let money jeopardize relationships, don't let money jeopardize family. Um, let's say that you know you have a family member that you know you fight with or they're sick or something like that. If you have money in the bank to help them right now help that person because when that person dies, all you're going to be thinking about is I don't care about this money I have. I could have helped this person. Um, and you know, that's just so much more important. So I would just say, yeah, having all those things in my life, being happy and, and helping everyone around me is, is going to be uh, my key in the next 10 years. Dude, one, just in meeting you in person and sitting down and talking, you're such a genuine person you've talked a lot about it, but you have a great presence for being 24 years old. You come off very mature. You have a lot of passion about what you're doing. And I'm sure anybody listening can hear that and see that. So dude, it has been an absolute pleasure to get to sit down, pick your brain and, and, and get you to drop some knowledge for everybody listening. I want to make sure that anybody who enjoyed this conversation wants to work with you from an agency perspective or just wants to connect with you can go and follow you. What are the best social media platforms or the best social media platform for them to connect you? Just message me on Instagram, Dre Medici, D-R-E-M-E-D-I-C-I, -I, and make sure that you send me a message. Don't just follow me. Send me a message, say the word on dress, and I'll give you 25% off any of my services. Dude, thank you so much again for coming on the show. I always say that when I get to do these interviews, I'm now more connected to you and and rooting for you to win and crush it, and I know you will. So thank you for sitting here and sharing some truth bombs with the audience and giving them a brain dump on what it's like to operate a multi-million dollar businesses. And I can't wait to interview a year from now and talk about how much you've grown. Thanks for having me, brother.